My name is Carolyn Ray. I'm the CEO mm -hmm. of Journey Women. For those that I haven't met, welcome. This is our monthly uh, travel book club. We've been doing this for, I think we're getting on to about three years now, actually. We started in June or so, 2020. So, well, maybe not that long, but, um, but we're getting to that point. And every month we feature a book from a different part of the world in partnership with Trip Fiction, who helps us pick out, um, pick out some books. So this book tonight, I think I, I just wanna say, I think I picked this book, by the way. Um, because I had read so many amazing things about it and um, and we were very fortunate to um, to have Alka Joshi and I hope I'm saying that right jo jo yes, I'm having trouble talking tonight <laughs> um, join us on the call tonight the author of this book and I want to tell you I'm on to book two already because I loved book one so much and uh, we're so excited to have you here we also want to have a little chat with um, with the group here about safety in India, because as solo travelers, that's something that we're always thinking about when we travel. And uh, India is one of those places that um, that we, I think, would like to know better, but there might be a bit of fear. So I invited Mary Ellen Ward, who is actually on our Journey Woman Advisory Council, okay. and also runs tours in India, has lived there for many years, although Hello. she's Canadian. And so we're gonna have a little chat and keep it casual, but uh, Mary Ellen's here to answer any questions you have about uh, solo safety for women in India as well, which we're, which we're going to do at the end. And, um, and in this book club, um, the way it's gonna run tonight um, uh, is I'll just do a quick intro of Alta and then she's gonna talk a little bit about her journey uh, writing this book. And um, and then Sally's going to take over and facilitate some questions. And you're all welcome to either put questions in the chat or just ask them. We want to keep this really interactive. And and then we'll move on to a little bit of a discussion around solo safety and again answer questions that you might have around that. So um, and for those of you that are new, um, Journey Woman is. Uh, celebrating i can't believe it but actually celebrating 28 years this september so we're the first and you know original kind of solo travel uh publication for women and you're going to hear some more uh news coming out soon about some of the things that i'm planning for us going forward but um but it's an exciting time uh, i can't imagine what 30 years will be like but 2024 here we come and um uh, we invite you all to subscribe. I'll put the, uh, if you're new, subscribe to our newsletters and our emails and make sure that, um, that you're um, getting as much information as you can on solo travel and safety in particular. And uh, yeah, so I'm just laughing, Sal, at your comment. I have some of the original printed newsletters that Evelyn Hanna did uh, dating back to 1994, 1995. And um, of course, I have many things that that she uh, that she did um, that were given to me, but um, this is my third year as uh, you know stepping in to carry on her legacy as CEO. So exciting times, and just just as travel is starting to make a rebound, so we're excited about that. So let me um, I'm going to do an introduction of Alka, and I'm going to turn it over to her for a few minutes. I'll ask you all just to mute and make sure we don't get any weird sound effects as we do this. But again, um, Alka Joshi was born and raised in India at the age of nine, until the age of nine when her family moved to the United States for her father's doctorate education. She has a BA from Stanford University and an MFA for, from the California College of Arts. At age 62, she published her debut novel, The Henna Artist which immediately became a New York Times bestseller, a Reese Witherspoon book, book club pick, and was long listed for the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize and translated into 26 languages. Even more exciting, it's been developed into a Netflix limited series, and maybe you'll give us some insight into what's happening with that. Um, and her second novel is The Secret Keeper of Jaipur, which I have just started reading. Um, which was released in June, 2021. And then the third book, the Jaipur uh, Trilogy, The Perfumist of Paris will be released in March, 2023. And I've noticed on your Instagram that you've been 
posting some cover art for that. So we're excited to hear about that. So welcome so much uh, to our Journey Women Book Club. We're so flattered and honored that you came came to see us tonight. And normally, you know, we don't have authors on it on. So <laughs> I think this might be our first time. So welcome. Hey. <laughs> Well, thank you, Carolyn. This is really cool. I'm just so delighted that first of all, you know, you have this organization and this is all about women traveling all over the world and being safe and and uh, interested in what they're seeing. So um, I love it. Um, I have often, you know, traveled all over the world um, by myself or with a small group of people. And I love doing it that way. Um, Okay, so a lot of people ask me, what does it feel like to be an overnight success? And I always have to say, I have no idea. I don't know what it's like to be an overnight success because it took me 10 years and 30 drafts to write The Henna Artist and get it published. And um, I know that's not what most people want to hear. And in fact, I used to think that publishing was just like what I saw in the movies and in the TV uh, shows. You know, somebody just sits down and they write a book and then all the pages are flying out the door and the next thing you know, they're sitting at a bookstore and they're signing books. Well, you know, for most authors whom I have spoken to, it takes anywhere from about four to 10 years to write your first book, because really what you're learning is how to sustain interest over a 300, 400 page book how to develop characters so that it feels like each of your major characters is undergoing some sort of transformation by the end. And then also it takes a while to figure out how to make all of those components feel really natural so that a reader keeps turning the pages without getting slowed down and thinking, oh, well, I don't understand what this means. So um, in my journey in, uh, you know, when I was 51 years old, uh, there was this big recession going on and I had been running my own advertising agency. And so uh, there was gonna be a two year slowdown in my own agency and in my the work for my clients. So I thought, well, what am I gonna do for two years? And I thought, why don't I listen to what my husband has been telling me to do, which is to you know, learn how to write, like go and, and uh, study writing and figure out how to do it. And I said, well, I write, ads for a living. I know how to write. He said, no, it's not the same thing. <laughs> it's not the same thing at all writing a novel. So I uh, entered one of these, uh, you know, two year um, MFA programs, masters in fine art. And it wasn't that far from my house because I was lazy and I did not want to be traveling like an hour each way to some school. So I thought, well, this is close enough. And they've got a couple of instructors whom I've heard of before and I've read their books and I like their books. So I enrolled and at the same time, my younger brother was uh, buying a house in Jaipur, which is where most of our extended family still lives. And he was saying, you know, hey, anybody who wants to come from the family and stay here for as long as you want, you're welcome to do it. I'm not actually here, I'm in China right now. So whenever you guys wanna come is fine. And my mom said, honey, will you please take me? So I would take her. I would come back to America and finish up a semester of my uh, course. And then I would go back there and spend time with her again and bring her back for her doctor's appointments and then take her back again. So we, we did this little dance for about four or five times while I was in my program. And what was really cool about it is number one, I had not spent this much time with my mother since I was 18 years old and went away to college. And I don't know how much time you guys spend with your mothers, but there comes a point in your relationship with your mother where you start actually sharing some very important things about um, how you think and what your relationship with people is and how you felt as a child growing up and how they felt as uh, a young mother and so on. And my mom and I started sharing those kinds of things because I was in my 50s, mom's in her 70s. And so we're sort of at that stage where we can talk about these things. And I think as my mother started talking, I realized that she had led such a different life. She had not had the kind of independence that I have always had. She had not um, experienced what it was like to pick her own partner in life because she had an arranged marriage. I don't know how many of you guys are watching that Netflix um, uh, Indian matchmaking, but you know, I love it. I just, it's really fun to watch. In any case, my parents were in an arranged marriage. Um, they were matched by socioeconomic circumstance and education and so on. 
And, uh, and then, um, you know, she had never had a career. She didn't get to finish college because she was told to come home and get married. And so um, with me, my mother always said, I'm going to give you all those things that I didn't get to do. So you will pick your own partner. You will go to college and decide on your own what you want to do with your life. I am never going to get in the way of any of that. You will pick your own career. But that's one thing I do request of you, Alka. You need to figure out for yourself what you want to do in your life. And you're going to have to pay your own bills. And I'd like you to do that before you get married. And that way you can stand on your own two feet before anything else happens. So I was like, okay. Uh, and I did everything that my mother, you know, kind of wanted me to do or requested. Um, and so I thought, you know, I have had an amazing life. I've traveled all over the world. I've worked all over the world. I did pick my own partner and I waited until I was 35, 36 years old um, because I was so busy doing all these other things. And um, I think I would love to have had that life for my mother, but I can't go back and change her life. Hey, but you know what I can do now that I'm learning how to write a novel, I can create a character like Lakshmi who gets to live the life that I think my mother would have liked. So two years after she gets married, Lakshmi leaves uh, her marriage. Uh, she goes on to forge a life of, of her very own, and she sets her own terms for uh, with everybody whom she's dealing with. And she has my mother's personality, and she looks just like my mother. And I know, um, you know, maybe you can or can't tell, but I actually have um, kind of uh, greenish blue eyes and uh, my mother did uh, as well. My mother had uh, greener eyes and then my younger brother uh, has greener eyes as well. So that's one reason why Lakshmi and her uh, sister and also baby Nikki, they all have these light colored eyes. Okay, so now fast forward another two years, I finished the henna artist as my master's thesis. Uh, my mother is is excited and uh, she's really proud of me for having completed this uh, novel. But eight months afterwards, she unexpectedly died very quickly. And I was bereft and I just thought, okay, I'm not going to continue working. I, I'm, I'm probably not meant to write a novel anyway. Um, this is probably just something I did for a lark for two years and clients are calling me back and saying, okay, recession over, let's start you know, working on some stuff again. And I gave up writing. A year later, one of my thesis advisors called me and said, um, Alka, what happened to the novel? We really think that you have a good chance of getting it published and we'd like you to try. And I said, well, I don't know, my mom, da, da, da. And so she said, listen, I've got some ideas on how you should continue working on it. So I start working on the novel again. It takes me another year to finish another um, uh, revision, uh, another version of it. And I send it all back to her and she sends it off to her agent. And the next thing you know, I've got an agent. I've got an agent in New York and she's calling me and she says, I love this book. And I said, well, if you love the book, then I am going to get published just like all the movies and the TV shows I've ever seen. I am suddenly going to be everywhere and I'm going to be signing books and everything. And she said, yeah, no, that's not happening because you still have so much work to do learning how to write a novel. It doesn't just happen like that, Alka. First of all, you've got, you're losing me on chapters three, four, and five. I don't even know what you're doing there. I don't know where you're going with it and then you know your ending is really weak and blah 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 and she points out all of these things and i'm thinking novel what is she talking about well you know people can like your basic idea but they still think that you're not quite there yet and she said, as a debut author, here's the thing, you have to have a novel that's going to be a bestseller because as a debut author, if you come out with just a middling novel, then you won't get a second book contract and a third book contract and you won't become a full-time writer. And if that's your intention, I have to make sure that you come out with a bestseller. I said, okay, Emma, you're, I'm, I'm placing myself in your hands. Tell me what to do. Over the next three years, she has me doing this and doing that and changing this and cutting out this character and adding this to this character. And then pretty soon, I have done now 15 revisions of this novel for her. And, and I'm getting really frustrated and I say, hey, um, Emma, at what point are we actually gonna send this off to a publisher? Like, I know how you feel about the novel, but <laughs> how are we ever gonna know if anybody else wants to publish it? And she said, well, Alka, listen, you're not there yet. 
I don't know what to tell you, but um, I can't tell you any more than I've told you. I'm just an agent. I'm not an editor. You need to hire yourself a professional editor. And here's a couple of names you can call. So I start calling around and I hire the first editor and she sends me back all these changes that she thinks I ought to make. And I, I said, no, I'm no, I'm not making those changes. <laughs> so I thought I better just hire another editor because I don't think that was the right one. And so I hire another editor and she sends me back even more pages of things that she thinks I ought to do differently in the novel. And by then I just totally lost it. I said, you know what, this whole writing thing, it's a racket. I don't, I don't believe in it. I think that people just are shining you on and you know, making you think you're gonna write a novel and it's never gonna happen. I give up. A year goes by and I don't do anything on this novel at all. Now keep in mind, it's been eight years since I first started working on the novel at this point. So I'm looking in my desk drawer for something and I reach across and um, I find this huge stack of papers and it's my manuscript. And I think, God, I spent so many years and so many drafts working on this. What is wrong with it? Why does nobody wanna publish it? And I start reading it. And, and because I'd had some distance from it, I thought, hey, this is a pretty good novel. Why does nobody wanna publish this thing? And then I thought, well, maybe I should go back and look at some of those edits uh, that the um, editors were suggesting. Maybe there's something I can do. And sure enough, because I had been away from it for a year, um, yeah, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, yeah, I can make some of these changes. So I start making them and another year goes by before I have another version to send to Emma. I said, Emma, remember me? Uh, I haven't talked to you in a couple of years because I didn't think I was actually gonna publish this novel. But here you go, here's another version. And well, please, please, I'm please. Kind of artist, but I'll turn it down. And I'll I said, you, and I said, please, 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 you know, send it off to a uh, publisher. And so she said, okay, all right, you know, don't, don't panic, fine, I'll do it. So she sent it off and then we have a um, contract with HarperCollins. I'm so excited, oh my God. But now I also have a new editor. And, um, and when you get a contract with the major publishing firms, you will get a new editor who's gonna want you to change some things in your novel as well. But at this point, I'm just so excited, um, I'll do anything. So Kathy sends me back a bunch of things that she would like me to do in the novel and we start working on it. There's gonna be 18 months from the time I sign that contract to the time it becomes a full-fledged novel at the bookstore, at the library. And so I'm, I'm working furiously on it. And, um, and then there's about six months to go before my release date. And so I just thought, you know, uh, let me see if there's something else I could be doing. And I start working on another novel, but Malik from the Hannah artist, who is only eight years old in this novel, he starts uh, talking to me and saying, you know, all those pages that you had to cut out revision after revision after revision, all those pages had me in them and they had Radha, the sister in them. And you had to cut those out because everybody kept saying, you know, you've got to focus on Lakshmi in this novel. And so why don't you write a novel about me? So I start working on The Secret Keeper. I'm 20 pages into the novel and my um, agent sends it off to my editor. And my editor calls me back right away and says, hey, I'm gonna send you a second book contract now. Now keep in mind, The Henna Artist is not even a book yet. It's not even uh, finished printing yet. But I now have a second book contract, which is exactly what my agent had said would happen if I wrote a good book. Okay, so now uh, I'm working on The Secret Keeper and my release date comes up. And my release date, strangely enough, was March the 10th, 2020. And on March the 11th, 2020, we had a whole world pandemic uh, happening and the World Health Organization said, okay, we need to go on lockdown, everybody. So all of the launch events that I had had planned, all the launch events got canceled. Every single uh, book signing gets canceled. All the book conferences that year get canceled that I'm supposed to go to. Nothing. I have nothing, nothing, nothing. And so I just thought, oh my God, you know, what kind of karma am I carrying around from a past life that is making this happen? Well, finally, um, I start uh, reaching out to social media and I said, hey, you guys, I've been telling you about this book for the last year, but, um, and Instagram, by the way, is just a great um, book place because there's so many book lovers on Instagram. And so I've been on Instagram and I said, you know, I've been telling you about this book. Now I, I just have to let you know that um, I can't talk to anybody about it, but if you wanna talk to me about it, why don't you DM me? Uh, if you have a book club, if you have an alumni group, whatever, 
just let me know that you want to talk to me about my book. Um, you know, get yourself an audio version, get yourself an ebook version, because now the libraries are closed and the uh, bookstores are closed and nobody is can go in and buy a, a, a hardcover book. And so people started responding. And at this point, you guys are my 761st group I have spoken to in the last two and a half years. And that's just because I was not going to let this book die, not after 12 years of working on it. So, um, so that's kind of what happened there. And then um, we get a call from Reese Witherspoon uh, a couple of months after that. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, all hell breaks loose because Reese Witherspoon says she loves the book. She wants to tell everybody about it. And then I start getting calls from movie houses. And yes, Netflix is uh, developing the henna artist for a limited release, which means uh, I think about six to eight episodes. And if those go well, then they will sign on for a second season and a third season. And um, as uh, the author of the book, I'm not actually writing the screen play um but i'm sort of a consultant and so they ask me every now and then you know would rather do this would lakshmi do that um you know would would lakshmi you know put it this way or that way in a dialogue or whatever so i get a chance to work with them on it and it's kind of cool to see the uh, interior workings frida pinto will play lakshmi which is really nice and then as soon as I was done with Secret Keeper of Jaipur, it went off uh, to the printers. And then I started uh, realizing that I have written Malik's story, but I have nothing about Radha in this story. I have to write another book now because people are going to be asking me, where did Radha go uh, You know, after the first book? So I started writing book number three, and that's The Perfumist of Paris, which is coming out in March uh, 28th of next year. And um, that book is all about Radha being a perfumer in Paris. Uh, at the age of 18, she met a Parisian. She went off to Paris. Uh, she's married. She has two daughters. She got into the perfume industry and um, she loves it. She's a natural at perfumes the way she was a natural at mixing the henna paste that uh, Lakshmi used to make. And uh, it's because she has kind of a, an organic uh, sense of chemistry. And as a perfumer, that's what you have to have. You have to study chemistry. So, um, so she is on the cusp of designing her very first signature scent when who should come along to Paris but the baby that she gave up in the henna artist <laughs> and uh, the baby that she gave up for adoption. And so that baby is now, is, is now 17 years old and um uh and he wants to know who his birth mother is okay so that's my story thank you so much carolyn for letting me tell it and i would love to um hear any questions or discussion that anybody wants to have around this well that is a story of resilience for sure and determination <laughs> we like that um that's fabulous i'm actually going to turn it over to um to sally jane to to do a little bit of a q a with you sally's our our co-host. Are you there, Sally? I am, yes. All right. I'm going to take off uh, the spotlight view just for a second. All right. And while you're doing that, Carolyn, I just want to remind everyone, please, just to mute your microphones because we are getting a little bit of background sound. Uh, it's such an easy thing to forget. Um, Great, thanks, Carolyn. And thank you, Alka. I'm so grateful you shared about your writing journey because I don't think most readers realize how many years and how many drafts and how much internal angst over ed editorial input can go into creating a book and especially a first book. So you've done me a favor because I was going to ask you some questions about that and you've helped me narrow down because I only get to choose one question, I think, before we open it up to the group. Um, so the question I wanted to ask you is, I wanted to refer to an event early in the novel where Lakshmi tells Radha about how their father sold their mother's wedding jewelry to help finance the independence movement. And I understand from hearing you speak in, in, in some recorded online events that this event has parallels in your own family history. And it's such a powerful moment, especially I think for me, it, I just glossed over it early in the book when I read through it, but as the book progresses and we learn about the economic significance of this jewelry for the women in the book, uh, it, it, it kind of grows in power as the book goes on. And I wonder if you could share a bit, bit more about the significance of the wedding jewelry and, and how it affected your family. Yeah, um, the wedding dowry includes 
jewelry from both sides of the family, from the bride side and from the groom side. And that jewelry is supposed to sustain that woman through her retirement, uh, if the husband dies, uh, through widowhood, um, through any kind of emergencies that come up. And um, what happened in 1965, 66, is that uh, India was uh, having a border war with China, the Indochina War. And uh, India said, look, we don't have enough money to buy munitions. So we need for you all to give us your gold and we can trade that for munitions from other countries. Uh, so my father took a whole bunch of my mother's jewelry and he just gave it to uh, the Indian government. You know, he got a little chit back and he was supposed to get all that gold back. I don't think uh, the Indian government ever paid him back all the gold, but my mother was furious because that was hers, you know, it wasn't his to give. Yeah. And he said, no, 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 this is, you know, we're being patriotic, we're being national, nationalistic, you know, this is something we need to do. No, my mother did not buy into that because, you know, the whole thing was supposed to be for her in the event of an emergency. And then my father sold her gold again at a, a different point when we first came to America uh, the, uh, you know, there were only a certain number of Indians allowed to come to America in 1960s. Um, and, you know, it was a very limited um, number and you could only come if you had a job or if you were uh, going to be in school. And my father uh, had been admitted to a PhD program in civil engineering. So that's why we came over. Uh, the other limitation was the amount of money that a family could bring in. And we were only allowed to bring in $10,000. Now this was for a family of five. It doesn't go very far. <laughs> $10,000 does not go mm. far. So by the time dad finished his PhD, um, we, know, we, we were living in graduate student housing and it was you know two bedrooms for the five of us. And there was one little oil heater in the whole house and this is Iowa. So I'm talking 30 below in the winter time. And it was, um, it was not the best of circumstances for us having been raised in the desert of Rajasthan to come to this place. And um, you know we just didn't have any money left. Dad just had no money left. And uh, so he started selling off mom's jewelry and that's how we stayed afloat for the last year before dad uh, was able to get his first engineering job and we moved out there. Wow, yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. It's so great to hear how, um, because I think that happens in most books directly or indirectly, you know, the, the, the author's life and experiences and emotions affect uh, what comes out in the final product of the book. So thank you so much for um, for sharing oh, that yeah. with us. Absolutely. I do want um, you know, I, I was just also going to say that, you know, my father as a teenager used to go to the Gandhi marches in India. And um, that's where I got the idea of the school teacher father of Lakshmi and Radha, who um, used to join in on the Gandhi marches to, um, to, to persuade the Britishers to leave India and to you know leave uh the uh governance of india to the indians themselves um so he was punished for that in the way that so many indians millions of indians were punished or uh put in jail or uh beaten uh or demoralized uh for asking the british to leave india and so I wanted to make sure that that also made it into uh, into the novel. So yeah, there's lots of little things that happen to us authors, I think, in real life, and they don't all show up in one character, but they may show up in several different characters yes. in different ways. Yes, yes. Yes, one of my greatest moments in my years when I used to work in museums was getting to hold in my in my my gloved hands the sandals that. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi made for the man who put him in prison in South Africa. He made a pair of handmade a pair of leather sandals, which he then gave to the then president, which is has so many layers of significance to to it. Um, but I will open up questions to the group. We've had one that so far come up in the chat, so feel free to type questions into the chat, or feel free to raise your hand on Zoom, which you do. Uh, I should have checked this out. Yeah, it's if you click on the reactions button at the bottom of your um, of your screen, there's an option to raise your hand, and we will do our best, Carolyn. Maybe you can help me field, uh, you know, look for questions because there are so many of us on the call today. The question that's already come up in the chat box is from Ariellen, who who's asked why the book 
why you chose to set the book in the 1950s, Alka? Okay. Um, I think that, first of all, my parents were married in 1955, and that was significant. In 1955, there was also a fabulous movie, a black and white movie um, uh, that came out in India. And, and you know, as you know, uh, India is a huge money uh, movie making uh, industry. And so India puts out about 2,000 to 2,500 movies a year, far more than actually Hollywood ever has in, in any given year. So one of the movies they put out that year was called Mr. and Mrs. 55. And it was about a young couple. It's kind of a rom-com. It's a young couple. Um, they are set uh, to be arranged in marriage. The woman does not want to marry him. She has a whole other ideas about what she wants to do with her life. And so uh, she learns that that year in 1955 was the first year that Hindus could get divorced legally. It was a law that came out in 1955. Ah. And uh, I think the movie was just a way of, to communicate to all of the Indian audience, hey, by the way, Hindus, you can go out and get uh, real divorces now. And so I wanted for Lakshmi to be able to get that divorce finally. She has been hiding the fact that she deserted her husband for 13 years and I wanted her to have some legal recourse to make that um, final. Uh, so that was another reason. And the third reason was that in 1955, uh, we are um, uh, eight years away from uh, declaration of independence in India. Oh, and by the way, India just had its uh, 75th anniversary of independence, yay. Um, and so they had their declaration of independence. Uh, and I wanted to explore what was happening in the country eight years after that. How did this country that had been colonized for over 200 years, how did they manage to maintain a democracy with as many millions of people as they have, with a as many diverse languages and religions that they have, and how did they manage to uh, even um, maintain that democracy over the last 70, 75 years and not devolve into a an autocracy, not devolve into a uh, dictatorship like a lot of pre uh, 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 previously colonized nations did. Um, so I wanted to explore what was going on and my dad was really instrumental in all of this because he had been a teenager before uh, independence and then after independence he remembers the exuberance of people and how much they wanted to rebuild this country um, that had so much to offer that had such a rich heritage and he was one of the young engineers he was one of the people who heard the call uh, of Nehru, Prime Minister Nehru said, you know, we need young engineers to help rebuild our infrastructure. And dad was one of those engineers. So it was a really, um, you know, fun time. And I want the world to understand that it takes a lot for a country to survive colonization and to rebuild themselves after colonization. But I don't think that that is recognition and appreciation about India's past that many people in the West have. Um, and, and, and I think that India deserves the respect um, of the Western world for how much it has accomplished. Because now, if you ask anybody, they would rather have an Indian doctor than a non-Indian doctor. They would rather have an Indian dentist than a non-Indian dentist. They would rather have um, an Indian running their high-tech uh, work than a non-Indian. And the only reason that you and I are able to Zoom right now with each other is because of all the Indians who have worked in hardware and software to make something like this possible. And I just think that India deserves a lot more recognition than it gets. Absolutely. I've got a bunch of questions coming to me in the chat chat. I've got one from Amita and she's asked what inspired you to make the protagonist a henna artist? Um, a couple of different things. One is I thought, okay, um, when Lakshmi leaves her marriage, she's only 17 years old. She doesn't have a high school diploma. She doesn't have an, any kind of education or training that would allow her to work in an office. Um, and so what does a girl like that do coming from a village? What could she possibly do? And then I thought about all of the women I have ever seen with henna on their hands for different festivals and different occasions. And I thought if she has a modicum of um, artistic talent, she would be able to use that to create those kind of designs. So I was talking to my mom about it. I said, mom, I'm gonna make her a henna artist. And my mom said, well, 
couple of things, honey. You know, you've made her a Brahmin and we are Brahmin. We're not allowed to become henna artists because that's not a, the, the work of our caste. And so I said, well, yeah, but mom, if that's the only thing she knows how to do, and if it allows her to sit on the same divan as an elite, uh, you know, Brahmin woman or Rajput woman, and also then at the same time, be able to go into the kitchen and talk to the household staff, then I need for her to be able to have this job that sort of makes her a little bit lower than a, re a regular Brahmin caste person. So kind of a fallen Brahmin. And my mom said, yeah, I guess that works. <laughs> so, so that is how Lakshmi came to be uh, a henna artist. I just think it allowed her a lot more latitude as a character uh, to be able to go in and out of many different uh, class situations. Fantastic, thank you. I have a question that's come to me as a direct message from Margaret. And Margaret says she's so interested in the Ayurvedic remedies that were mentioned, and she was wondering where she can get Bachi. Uh, Margaret, I'm guessing you're in the <laughs> States? Everybody wants to know that. You know, the other thing that people ask me, um, because that's the, that's the stuff that's supposed to make your hair grow. Um, the other yeah. thing that people ask me is uh, at the very end of the book, there is the neem vendor's wife and Lakshmi in order to lift up her breasts, which have, you know, fed three babies and are now drooping. Uh, you know, she draws these, <laughs> leaves, these spiraling leaves up and everything. So people keep asking me all the time, where can I get that done? <laughs> I think a lot of us can relate to that. <laughs> so, um, uh, I think you can get, get it. Actually, people have told me that they have found it on Amazon and it's spelled different ways. Sometimes it's Babchi, sometimes it's Bachi, you know, uh, it's spelled in many different ways, just like almost all Hindi words are spelled very differently, depending on whether you're from the south or the north or the east or the west of India um, and how it's translated, you know, into English. Um, so how I got information about these herbal remedies is a uh, couple of different ways. One is uh, for anybody here who has grown up in a South Asian family, you know that your mother is teaching you about spices and why you need a certain spice uh, cooked in a certain way with a certain kind of vegetable in order to help your body. Uh, you know, whether it's to uh, bring down the heat uh, during a um, hot spell, whether it is to cool you down, whether it is to um, you know, take down some inflammation on a cut or a bruise that you have. Your mother has taught you, your grandmother has taught you these kinds of herbal remedies. Uh, my mother would always say, you know, chew on some fennel seeds when you have some kind of indigestion. And I swear to you, like, if you guys want to try it, you know, instead of taking Tums next time, just have a few um, fennel seeds that you just keep chewing and, and um, you know, um, uh, sort of take down the saliva that comes from it and your, you know, your uh, heartburn will be gone. So there's some stuff that I just know from having grown up in my family. There's other stuff that I had to research. And every time I would go to India, I would talk to Ayurvedic doctors. You know, there really are Ayurvedic doctors. Like you can go to your regular medical doctor for your diabetes. And then you might also, as many Indians do, go to your Ayurvedic doctor because uh, maybe you have, you know, a skin breakout and you think the Ayurvedic medicine would help you more than uh, Western medicine would. Um, and then I think the last thing I did was I, I read up on, uh, you know, there are certain books that you can buy about Ayurvedic medicine. And so I would just read, read those and see what I could pick out something that Lakshmi could use for one of her, uh, clients. We've got time for just a couple more questions before we move into the next segment of, of, of the, um, of our meetup. I've got one here from Anne Moore and she says, because women owning homes was atypical in the 50s, you didn't mention her 13 years of saving money until later in the book. And please, could you talk about that timing? And she also says she just wanted to mention P.S. Jaipur is her favorite Indian city. <laughs> um, so Lakshmi wasn't allowed to own a home, and that's why she had to have Samir uh, actually put his name on the uh, deed for her. And it makes her a little suspect because even the builder thinks uh, that she must have done something untoward uh, to get a man to sign uh, sign over this house for her. But um, yeah, women at that time weren't allowed to own, put their names on property. 
Um, so, uh, you know, she's been uh, saving money all these years and that's how she ended up buying the land. And then she's been spending um, the more of the money that she's earning to, um, to uh, get it all fitted out. Um, in the beginning, Samir loaned her money because she needed money to buy supplies. She needed money for lodging and she didn't have that kind of money saved up. So in the beginning, he did loan her the money and she paid him back with interest. She was adamant about that. She did not want to owe him for no reason at all. She wanted to be have it be a business transaction. And I think that in those little ways is how I try to show that Lakshmi has, first of all, a business sense. But secondly, also, she has a lot of integrity. She does not um, want to take advantage of Samir and what he's offering her and she doesn't want to owe a man anything. <laughs> Another question that's come up, which is perhaps related, is Joan has mentioned that a woman entrepreneur was a rarity in the 1950s and probably not that common today. And have you had feedback that your book has inspired women businesses at all? Um, I have had a lot of feedback that my books have inspired women who also have gray hair to start writing <laughs> <laughs> yes because i think that you know so many women feel that um i don't know maybe after they've raised their children like what am i going to do with my life now you know uh i had all these passions back in my 20s and 30s and i've left them behind and i just you know really tell all women that um writing is age proof you can write at any time in your life in fact i actually think that it's better to write uh, and to do anything creative past the age of 60 or 50, because by now you have known grief, you have known love, you have known loss, you have known, um, you know, betrayal. Uh, and I think you probably do understand that we're all capable of being good and bad simultaneously. We all are not perfect. None of us is perfect. And so you're able to write characters who are not perfect, like Lakshmi. She is not perfect. You know, Radha is not perfect. Samir is not perfect. None of these people are. Um, so uh, I, I, I think what I've done is I've really, really encouraged a whole group of women who are in their 50s, 60s and 70s to start writing. Additionally, I have um, heard from a lot of South Asian women, either who are growing up right now in India or have lived most of their life in India and also ones who live across the global diaspora. But uh, these South Asian women who say, thank you for writing a book about what it's like for us, you know, um, that there is a patriarchy that exists, that it still exists, and that we constantly have to try to figure out ways to stand up for ourselves despite the patriarchy. I'm going to sneak in one more question before we move on to uh, the issue of um, all the questions about traveling safely in India, because we've had quite a few pe women ask us about that. Um, I wanted to ask, I know your family moved to the States when you were, were nine, I think, certainly when you were a child. And I think there are quite a few of us in the group who are migrants, either having moved to a different country or having moved to a different part of their own country. And I was interested to know what your experience was traveling back to the country of your birth and, and how you found contemporary India different from the India of the 1950s that you wrote about, especially with regard to things like, like the caste system and birth control and abortion and arranged marriages. So I, get, I realize there's a lot in that question, yeah. <laughs> but I'd love to hear your impressions. Sure, yeah. So uh, several differences I found. One is that in my mother's era, probably 90% of the marriages were arranged. And today it's more like 70, 75% of marriages are arranged. So that means that there's a lot more what they call love marriages going on. The, the Kanta and Manu had a love marriage, for instance, and there are more and more of those. And the reason that there are more of those is because India has had such a surge of the middle class growth uh, in the last 30 years. 
And because they've had uh, such a surge, it means that both girls and boys are getting to go to college because their parents can afford it. Girls go to college and their world opens up for them. They're like, oh my God, you know, I don't have to, you know, I'm not being sheltered in this family life anymore where I can only do this or that. Now I can see that the whole world is my oyster. So they are being exposed to so much more and they are very ambitious. You know, girls are just as ambitious as boys. Of course, we know that. And so um, they're like, okay, now I want to be an engineer. I want to be an astronaut. I want to be an artist. I want to be this and that and the other. I want to start my own business. And so they go back home to their parents and they go, okay, this is really what I want to do. Uh, oh, and by the way, I've fallen in love with this other boy and he's not from our cast and I really want to marry him. So those kinds of things are happening. And as these girls, um, you know, get their ambitions realized, what they're saying is, um, I am so busy working on my PhD. I'm so busy getting myself established in my career. Um, I don't also have time to look for a partner. So parents, can you look for a partner for me? So that also you know, happens. So that happens 70, 75% of the time that the parents uh, who know their daughter uh, better than anybody will look for that partner for them. Um, but a lot of women are choosing to stay single. There's like something like, you know, 60 million single women in India right now, uh, either because they're choosing to stay single or because they're widowed or because they're divorced. Divorce rates are climbing. And I think the same thing happened in the United States when women started going to work in the 60s, divorce rates shot up. So by the 70s, you know, we're finding 30% of all households are divorced. And now it's, you know, over 50%. So um, I think uh, on, I, I think this is kind of a statement about how um, we as a society can grow in one area, but it's going to impact another area where maybe we're going to experience some trauma. And I think that the, the same thing is happening uh, in India as well. There's a lot more pizza huts. <laughs> <laughs> And there's a lot more McDonald's, you know, that I see every time I go. Um, but India really still, Indians hold fast to their uh, religious rites, to their festivals, to, um, you know, going to the temples. There's, uh, you know, I see temple goers everywhere. There are tiny little temples everywhere uh, in public uh, areas. And you can just go there and worship uh, on your own. Hinduism is a very, what I would call a personal religion. Uh, it's not a it's not something where you have to go every Sunday to a service and you know be around all these other people you can just practice at home or you can practice just personally you know yourself privately um, so you know there's uh, there's a lot of tradition that Indians still hold on to and of course they hold on to their food because there is no better I think way to be healthy um, than to use Indian spices in your cooking, than to use turmeric and cumin and, um, uh, you know, uh, black pepper and pink pepper and, um, you know, coriander and, you know, all of these spices, ginger, these are such good uh, spices for your soul, for your body, for your well being. Uh, so I think that Indians uh, still hold on to all of that. And, you know, even though they might go to a McDonald's at one point during the week, they'll still be having Indian food the rest of the week. Yes. Okay, thank you so much for sharing this time with us. There have been quite a few comments in the chat about just how wonderful it is for readers to get a glimpse of what has gone on behind the finished pages, which is all most of us ever see. Um, in fact, Carolyn, we'll need to work out how to save this chat before we close the, the meeting because uh, it's, it's, there's been so much happening there that I, that I, I want to be sure I've seen it all. Um, I do have a ton more questions, but I'll hand over now to Carolyn and Marie-Ellen um, to talk about uh, safety for women travelers in India. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you, Sally. And, Thank you so much. Um, Oh, that was just fabulous. Thank you. You know, we want to make this uh, as interactive as possible. So I, I kind of invite both of you to uh, contribute to this, but we did want to address the, the issue of uh, safety in India. And Mary Ellen is, as I mentioned at the outset, she's part of our Journey Woman Advisory Council, which has been around for about two years. And she's one of our experts and has been part of the Journey Woman community for how long, Mary Ellen? 10? 15 years, long time, right? 
Um, yes, ever since I ever since I started travel blogging, um, when I first started, I reached out to Evelyn. She was my mentor, so a lot of history there. Yeah, and so Mary Ellen has her own website called Breathe, Dream, Grow, and she also uh, has a company called India for Beginners, and she does uh, small group tours all across India. So. Um, we're curious if you all have any any questions about solo safety or, or Mary Ellen Seth. If you want to start with any you know sage advice from your perspective, and and I want to you know, I think part of this is um, for us as women to talk about these things and address any misconceptions that might exist about our safety in India and through talking to each other, but also by going there ourselves and finding out for ourselves. Uh, what things are really like and not being always swayed by what we read in the, the mainstream media. So uh, with that, Mary Ellen, I'll turn it over to you, kind of kick us off. Thank you very much for the introduction and to be part of this amazing event. I, I love the henna artist and it was <laughs> wonderful to hear from Alka and I've got it right here and I can't wait to read the, uh, um, the second one. Um, and I also, we've been talking about Jaipur in the chat and I'm also one of those many people who love Jaipur, actually thinking of moving there. So this has been great. Thank you very much. Um, so I did want to uh, just tell people, um, I've been traveling in India for, uh, traveling or living in India uh, for about seven years. So I've spent a lot of time here. Um, but when I originally um, planned to go to India back in 2004, 2005, when I went on my first trip, which was the six month you know, epic life-changing trip across the country. Back in those days, 2004, 2005, when I was getting ready to go, the topic of travel safety for women in India was not, um, it wasn't a big topic of discussion the way it is now. It wasn't a big concern the way it is now. Mm -hmm. I remember doing my research and the concerns were more around, you know, just the chaos, the heat, the crowds, um, avoiding getting sick, trying to figure out how to get a train ticket and not be overwhelmed and um, I did a lot of research including I was on the journey woman site all the time doing research that's how I first connected with journey woman back then and uh, but the topic of travel safety wasn't wasn't a big issue the way it is now and my feeling is that it following the uh, 2012 uh, Delhi gang rape which got uh, which was a horrific incident which which got so much media attention and it also, um, I think it sort of blew the cover off issues of uh, women's safety in India, like domestic violence and so-called Eve teasing, which is actually sexual harassment and all kinds of other issues that were, were probably maybe um, a little bit hidden, you know, and a little bit taboo, maybe. That incident, which was awful, of course, but it had, I suppose you could call it a silver lining in the sense that it brought these issues out in the open. And and so I have sort of two thoughts on that. And one of them is it's great that those issues came out in the open and now they can be addressed and talked about. Obviously, that's a good thing. But the negative side of it is it, it gave India a really, really terrible reputation for women's safety. And um, I suppose to a certain extent that's deserved. But to a certain extent, I also think that's a media creation. Um, that's a mis misperception. And I also think that people got confused about there may be a lot of domestic violence in India, and that's not good. However, how does that impact a tourist in India? Is that actually, is, is there actual danger to a tourist in India? And all of these issues got very conflated and confused. Um, and so ever since then, I, I, that's my feeling. I mean, somebody else may have a different take on it, but my feeling is it's really since that incident that the issue of women's travel safety in India has become so topical. Um, and from my own experience, um, I think it helps. Okay, young, young women can't do anything about this, but I didn't start traveling in India until I was 45. And I, I really think it helps being older because you're not so much of a target and you're probably a little tougher and you've got a little more of a thick skin. So my first bit of advice is be over 50, 45. Um, that's kind of a joke, but uh, um, I, I, I've heard about the, the harassment that younger women get. And I really haven't been that, I have had my uncomfortable moments for sure, 
but compared to what I've heard from younger women, I haven't had that kind of harassment. Um, and then part of it might be my attitude, part of it might be, well, I've been in India so long, I'm very comfortable here. Um, and I'm not saying I've never been uncomfortable, I have. I've had uncomfortable moments. I've had a few negative incidents, of course. I was groped once in Old Delhi. Um, I've had men follow me a couple of times, once in Mumbai. But overall, I personally have not felt unsafe or threatened. I've always been able to deal with the situation. So I, my, my, my feeling is that, you know, if it's like Ariel just said in the chat, if India calls to you, if you really feel compelled to go to India, you should definitely go. I, I wouldn't worry too much. I wouldn't become afraid. I would do my research. I would use caution and common sense, um, all of those things. But if you want to go to India, I, I mean, I wouldn't hesitate to go. I would just do it, you know, with some common sense and some caution and research. And, you know, this is all the reasons I started my company. Um, I was a travel writer and blogger for many years. Actually, I was the third travel writer or travel blogger in India way back in 2005. <clears throat> but I am now a, the owner of a India for Beginners custom tour company. And we, we, our motto is that we hold your hand in India. So we give custom tour tour services so however you know if you want us to design your entire tour and do all the bookings or if you just want some services but we're there for you we're available 24 7 and we we just help you know we we want women to, to travel safely and well as so my whole blog breathe dream go is dedicated to this my company is dedicated to this and I love India. It's the most exciting, transformative, amazing country on earth, if you ask me. And I want to help people come here. So I don't want them to hesitate, but I also want them to be smart. Mary Ellen, any quick tips um, that you would put out there as advice? Well, I think my number one tip is always do your research. Find out about the culture, the customs, and research your destinations. I think if you're a first time visitor to India, you should probably stick to the more touristy places. They're amazing anyway. I mean, Rajasthan is one of the top, um, Jaipur is the capital of Rajasthan and it's one of the top tourist destinations for tourists in India. But if you think that it's been ruined by tourism, it has not, not at all. The culture is strong and it's beautiful and it's amazing. So don't hesitate to go to, even if you think, oh, you know, that place gets a lot of tourists like Kerala or Rajasthan. No, no, don't hesitate to go. It's still, you know, you'll, you'll get an authentic um, cultural experience for sure, but you'll also get the tourism infrastructure. That's great. Any questions anyone would like to ask, either in the chat or comments about their, their travel to India, anything they've experienced or want to talk about? You know, one thing, um, the, I, I was just uh, listening to a, um, I went to a photography exhibit and this woman had taken beautiful photographs of India. And one of the things she said is, you know how in certain cultures, you're not supposed to look directly into people's eyes because you're stealing their soul. Well, in India, she said, it's totally different. In India, people will look at you directly into your eyes because they want to see into your soul. Um, and you will find a lot of people are looking straight at you. And I'm sure Mary Ellen has experienced this too. They're not staring at you in any kind of negative way or bad way. Please don't, you know, think like that. They're actually just curious. They're curious about you. They want to know why you're there. They want to know, um, you know, all about you. Uh, and I, I find it, I find that to be a very charming trait of Indians. They are always very curious about, um, foreigners. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, the staring. Uh, well, first of all, you always see a lot more men in public than you do women. So that can be unnerving for people who are not used to it. And then, yeah, the, the staring. Yeah, you have to get used to that for sure. And of course, 99.999% of the time, it's completely harmless. It's just curiosity, you know, and um, one of my top tips always for women is to trust your instinct. So there might be a time when that staring it feels off just listen to that and get your get yourself out of that situation is anyone planning travel to india show of hands a few people that's great are you are most of you going solo or are you going in a 
with a group or a group of people? What's what are your plans? I'm going with family, Carolyn. I am from, yeah? originally from India, so I I can tell you. Um... <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Diane. Uh, sorry, yeah, I'm actually going to, I'm going, I'm joining a tour uh, in the Kuch, uh, Kujarat area. I'm doing two, actually two back-to-back -back tours for three weeks. And then I'm on my own for about a week and a half. And Mary Ellen tells me, plan a bit of that. Um, hopefully we'll be able to do something um, for my, for my Delhi portion. But I'm going from, I'm basically on my own from Jaipur, spending time in Jaipur on my own. I go into Delhi because I don't have time to do anything else after being away for a month. I've got to get back. Otherwise, I would do the Himalayas. I'd be going to southern India. I'd be like, I, I want to do it all. And I just can't do it all in one trip. So <laughs> I, I, I'm hoping I'm going to like it enough. I'm going to want to go back <laughs> and do more of India, you know. But uh, I'm so looking for Carolyn, you know, I've been one. I was going to say yeah, from day one. This, like, I've talked about yeah. it nonstop for two years now. <laughs> yeah. And the, then the pandemic hit and it kept being put off and put off, put off. So this is why I'm missing the uh, retreat in October, because this is when I my trip to India was rescheduled. So can't do the retreat, but I can't give up India. There's no way I can give it up. I, I don't so think I'd let you. To it. <laughs> we have to. We have to make sure we, we have to make sure we, <laughs> we have to make sure we meet, Diane. Let's coordinate meetings. Yes, it would be wonderful. Yeah, yeah, it would be wonderful. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Amita, which part of India is your family from? Um, my family's from Bangalore, so I'm from South India. And that's the other thing I wanted to note. I feel like South India is safer mm. than the North. At least that's how I personally feel. There isn't as much of the e-teasing that you find in the North. Thank you. Yeah. There's also a question that just came up in the chat um, that maybe Marielle and maybe you can help us with. Uh, Debbie wants to know what is the climate for lesbians in India? Um, well, anybody can jump in who has more knowledge about this than, than me. I know that homosexuality was illegal still in India until about uh, three years ago. Do you remember the date also when they decriminalized it so it's actually very recent that um, homosexuality um, has been uh, decriminalized um, but there are some lesbian characters in popular fiction now um, so you see it like like modern like Netflix series and things like that have have lesbian characters so I think you know it's starting to become more accepted but that's probably more in the urban areas yeah um, but I yeah. personally don't, I, I, yeah I don't know you might want to chime in on this um, so, uh, wherever you are in India, try not to exhibit PDAs, you know, uh, personal displays of affection. Uh, so whether you're a heterosexual or homosexual, you do not want to display your affection in public. Indians don't do that and they don't want you to see you doing that either. Um, so that is what's going to cause you trouble. If you try to kiss your partner in public, that is a no-no. Try never to do that, please. <laughs> Except you see guys walking around hand in hand all the time. Friends, right? You always see the guys yes. walking hand in hand and with their arms around each other. That seems to be okay. <laughs> that's okay because, you know, that's how they're raised. And you'll see girls also holding hands, uh, you know, and walking around, but not adult boys and not adult girls. Interesting. So much to learn. I feel like we could keep talking for a long time, but we've come to the end of our, our hour together. And um, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Alka, Mary Ellen, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your story. Uh, you made this, uh, I think this is one of our best book club yet. So I want to thank you so much for, uh, for making the time to be here. And just a reminder, um, you know, we do have a safety resources section on our website. There are tons and tons and tons of articles about women's safety. And uh, last year we did self-defense training. 
uh, classes. The videos are still available on YouTube if you want to take a look at them. And there are lots of articles about that because, you know, we can have all these these safety discussions, but really the it starts with us and being able to uh, trust our intuition, use our voice, use our bodies to protect ourselves. So, um, so I encourage you to go go take a look at it. And the last thing I will mention quickly is, um, you know, the reason that that Diane and so many of the other uh, women on this call, I've gotten to know them so well is through our community calls. And so we're hoping to start those up again in September. And I sent out a little survey. Uh, I think it was last week looking for your input on when you'd like to do those and what kinds of topics you'd like to do. So if you have a chance to um, fill that out, that would be great because we want to start those up again and, and uh, have topics, have discussions like this that you know, no one else is talking about. We can talk about it. We're we're here to do that. So, thank you all. Have a lovely <laughs> night. Thank you, Sally. And we Sunny. will see you. Thank you. Sunny, thank you. Namaste. And and bonjour. Welcome. Namaste. <laughs> Namaste. And we thank will you. see you. And if uh, I could just have a quick shout out next month. Yeah, I was going to mention next month's book. Now, okay. Just, just before you do that, I just wanted to. I just oh, wanted yes. to exactly. have a quick shout out to to Wendy. Some of you may have wondered why Wendy wasn't here today. She's the usual host for Book Club um, and she's actually traveling today, but I see she's managed to dial in. She's I, I, I know she's flying today, so I'm not quite sure how present she is. So thanks, Wendy, for joining us. And uh, yeah, for all the new people here, it would be great if you can join in our book discussions on Facebook. Um, we do post there from time to time, so keep an eye out for us in the group. Sorry, Carolyn, you go ahead. I just remembered our next book is called The Diver's Clothes Lie Empty, I believe. I've already read it. It's about Morocco. And if you haven't started it already, the first uh, chapter, you'll go, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it is about yeah. safety. It is, um, it is a very interesting book to read. And uh, so I encourage you to read it. And we have made one change to the October book, which is Remember Me by Charity Norman. We have moved that out because we're finding it difficult to um, to get uh, paperback uh, and hardcover copies right now because it is a new book. So we've replaced that with the Guernsey Potato Peel Society uh, book for October. And then we're just working on the rest of the year um, and may actually send out another poll to get your ideas. So um, so that's all in, all in progress, but... Um, Hope to see you all next month. It's so great having you here. We really appreciate it. Bye, everybody. Thanks, yeah, everybody. Thank you. Bye.